And now, broadcasting from deep behind enemy lines in the occupied territory of the Socialist Republic of California, your host, former California State Assemblyman and Governor Candidate, Tim Donnelly. Hey, welcome to the, welcome back to the Radio Free California Network. What is this, uh, Feng Shui Friday? <laughs> we can go with Bo Friday, <laughs> Feng Shui Friday. Uh, no, it is uh, definitely a day that uh, shall live in infamy <laughs> for the Republicans. I, what, what's up with Paul Ryan? What is he, Nancy Pelosi in drag? It, it, the, the guy, the guy's out there pushing a bill, pushing a trade deal, and and a fast track authority for the president on a bill he's never even read, on a on a package that nobody's read to the satisfaction of anyone, and they want to fast track this deal, but they got they got slapped down, Obama and his Republican enablers. His codependent. I I wonder if they have like a twelve step program for, for them. What for politicians? Yeah, yeah, they're gonna need it. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're a neighbor. I, I I mean, I, I was thinking about it today, and I, I I I I have this sneaking suspicion that a lot of people have no idea what what happened or or what any of the abbreviations are. There's the TAA that got voted down 302 to 126. Well, that's the Trade Adjustment Authority, which goes hand in hand with the Trade Promotion Authority that the Republicans passed. But with only one of them passing, they the other is dead in the water. So on Tuesday, they're going to have another vote, and... They're going to try to get this trade adjustment authority through. What What is the trade adjustment authority? It's there to compensate workers who are displaced by the trade deal. They know the trade deal is going to hurt the American worker. Well, if you know the trade deal is going to hurt the American worker, why don't you make a better deal? I don't know. It's just a crazy thought. Um, we pay you guys a lot of money. It's your only job. You don't have to run a business or anything. You just show up and you vote. And we'd like you to make deals that make sense. You know, the only person that has really come out and brought clarity to this entire mess has been Senator Jeff Sessions, who just put it all in perspective. This is all about, so if you're wondering what the TPA is, the Trade Promotion Authority it's just a transfer of power from the Congress to the executive branch. So the people who were worried about giving Obama too much power, the Republicans, the Republicans who were elected to oppose and fight and, and express the deep distrust of this president and his policies, which overreach, are going to give him more power. They're going to give the dude more power. Did you hear that? That, that, yeah, that's a rhetorical question. You, you don't have to answer there in the production booth. I'm just. I'm trying to work over here, Tim. I, I, I'm, 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 uh, it's just so, you know, it, it, what in the world is it coming to when the voice of reason is Nancy, you got to pass it if you want to know what's in it, Pelosi. When she's the most rational voice in Washington, D.C., in the House, something's very wrong. <laughs> in, uh, something's in the water there. And I guess when those who are supposed to be on our side wind up doing things that don't make any sense that are completely indefensible on any principle and, and Jeff Sessions brings it out and, and talks about why why would you want to give this president more power and why would you want to give up the power to go through a trade deal line by line 
because the devil's always in the details. Right now, you remember uh, uh, our, our friend Paul Paul Ryan, Nancy Pelosi, and Drag is is so he, he we had him on a clip yesterday saying, "Well, there's no uh, there's no deal." So the TPP, the toilet paper trade package, doesn't even exist. There's eight. 100 pages that you can go into the basement of the Capitol and read. Remember, we played Nancy Pelosi, or Bar I'm sorry, uh, Senator Barbara Boxer, who said she took her staff there to go look at it, and the, and, and the guards confiscate your notes. So it does exist, Paul. I don't know where you're getting your facts, but your facts are wrong, so therefore they're not facts. They're misrepresentations. They're lies. And, and, and why is he pushing so hard for such a horrible idea? That, that's the real question, and, and it comes around to, once again, follow the money. Who's financing these guys? And, and why is it that they are willing to give the president unilateral authority to essentially negotiate a trade deal, put his signature on it before anyone has actually seen the final copy then it comes to the congress they got to vote it up or down and and then you bring in all the money and all the 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 the, the mafia hitmen that that the 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 enforcers within the political world who terrify and terrorize anyone and everyone that might have anything in their closet or or they br just outright bribe them and that's how they jam through a bad deal. And Jeff Sessions asked a simple question. He just said, hey, why not? Uh, 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 he said, if, uh, if this is somehow going to give Congress more power over Obama and strip away Obama's executive authority to unilaterally negotiate a trade deal, wouldn't he just veto it? I, I think that's really logical. Yeah, he Obama is for absolute unilateral executive authority over this country. Anybody who's been watching him gets that. So he's not going to get excited about a deal that gives him less power. What this does is this gives the congressman more time to go golfing. What, what are you doing in there? You, you, are you throwing things? I mean... No? What? <laughs> This is maybe we should call this the uh, the golf course trade package because the Congress won't have anything to do. They just have to vote it up or down. They won't actually have to look into the details. They won't have to look at whether or not we're going to bring the United States under some odious climate change agreement, climate, global warming, global freezing, whatever the hell you want to call it today. Uh, they won't have to look at whether or not it has provisions to allow more foreign workers to come here on visas. They won't, and, and whether or not Congress has, and have they completely ceded all of their authority, which may very well happen if this deal goes through. And we don't know. I, I, I can't say definitively, but there are very intelligent people with very serious questions about this. And the, 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 but the very idea that you would have those who, who we thought were on our side, the Republicans, those who were going to oppose Obama's amnesty, they were going to oppose Obamacare, they were sent there to, to be an effective check and balance to keep this president in line. And they'd just rather go golfing than do their jobs. They'd rather go out and party with the lobbyists than do their jobs. I don't know who bought them, but the idea of giving a president such sweeping powers and then saying it's all about transparency, but you can never see the bill. And by the way, we're going to vote on something we've never even read and have no idea what the implications will be on the average American you know, we have a simple solution for that. Those of us out here in the fruited plains or even on the left coast. Yeah, it's called replacing you. 
Who needs that? What, we, we could just have robots voting for us. If, if, the, if that's all you're going to do is vote up or down, and we already know you're going to vote for whatever deal. If you pushed for, for the authority, you're going to vote for the deal. It just leaves me absolutely speechless. But not for long. 323-746-TALK. 323-746-8255. You can call in, tell me what you think about it. And we're going to talk about Rachel Dolezal coming right up after the break. I just want to defend my friend Loretta Sanchez. That chick, she is one hot mama. And when she does that war cry, she she usually does it right after. Oh, man, there is nothing in the world like making Loretta cry. You know what? I support Kamala Harris for U.S. Senate. I, I don't know about that Loretta Sanchez chick. She's out there doing that war cry. I thought she kept that stuff in the bedroom. Yeah, Loretta, you, you do it like this. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, I know. I know. Come on, Loretta, baby. You just, now you got me all red. No, not red skin. I just just red in the face. Pizza, pizza. So Rachel Dolezal, if you haven't heard that story, she can't decide if she's black or white. But if you look at her photograph, which is all over Twitter and all over the internet today, uh, Rachel who, by the way, is the president of her local NAACP chapter, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, is not colored. She appears to be Caucasian. So she is the leader of a group based on advancing the rights of those of color particularly black Americans, but she is not black. And so she was asked the question by a reporter, and you will hear her response. All came crashing down for NAACP Spokane President Rachel Dolezal who has been portraying herself as a black woman for the past 10 years. Confronted by a reporter, her parents are now calling her out. Ruth Ann and Lawrence Dolezal say their 37-year-old daughter is white. We are her birth parents, and we do not understand why she feels it's necessary to misrepresent her ethnicity. Her ethnicity, the elders say, is Swiss, German, Czech, and some Native American. They provided this photo of Rachel as a young girl on the left. On the right, here's what she looks like today. Seemed like she was <clears throat> just doing more of an uh, artistic, expressive representation of her identifying with African Americans by doing her hair and extensions and things like that. Rachel grew up in predominantly white Montana, but her parents say she immersed herself in the black community when she attended college in Jackson, Mississippi. Rachel's parents had also adopted four black children. Rachel has always been interested in ethnicity and diversity, and we had many friends of different ethnicities when she was growing up. So it didn't start with the four adopted children of color. It was uh, probably that added to her passion. Rachel even received a full scholarship to the historically black college, Howard University, which never inquired about her ethnicity on her application. 
eyes were popping and jaws were dropping when she walked in to finalize her registration in person. But the Dolezal say they became estranged from their daughter when she began to assume a new black identity. Rachel married an African-American man, Kevin, with whom she had a son, who posted a video about their love. I want to kiss you for the rest of my life. Later, Rachel would post Facebook pictures of one of her adopted brothers as her own son, referred to her natural curls, and identified herself on a job application as part black. As professor of Africana Studies at Eastern Washington University, Rachel was clear. I would definitely say that yes, I do consider myself to be black. But it was the questionable death threats and reported hate crimes against Rachel and her family, which led to an investigation and questions about her race. In January, the Spokane chapter of the NAACP posted a picture of Dolezal standing beside this black man who Rachel claimed was her father. She said he couldn't visit Spokane because he was battling lung cancer. Is that your dad? Yeah, that's, that's my dad. The question that she is asked in another clip that uh, I guess we don't have is, are you African American? And you look at her face and she's looks stunned that anyone would ever ask her that. And then she simply says, I don't understand the question. Oh, you have that? Okay, yeah, run that. Oh, 10 seconds. I, I'm wondering, is this, like, now there's no gender? Is there now no color? Is she, like, trans black? Roll it. This morning, swirling around a leader of the Spokane chapter of the NAACP, is Rachel Dolzel pretending to be part black? Her estranged parents coming forward saying that Dolzel is actually white and has been falsely portraying her race for years. When local TV station KXLY pressed Dolzel about these allegations, listen to what she had to say. Are you African American? I don't, I don't understand the question. <laughs> don't understand the question. Well, the city of Spokane, Washington is yeah, now investigating that, Dolzel. That, that, that says it all. I don't understand the question. Now, here's the whole point. If you make your life about race or about gender and then someone asks you a legitimate question about race or about gender and then you think you can throw it back on them with, I don't understand the question, I think it illustrates... The absurdity of this racial identity politics, this race-obsessed culture. Thank you, Barack Obama. Thank you, leftist media. Thank you, Hollywood. I think it's time we just get over it. Because I really don't care if she's black or white. I don't care if she wants to put her hair up into... Uh, an Afro. That's her right. She's an American. Um, I don't care if she actually runs a division of the NAACP. What difference does it make? The, the ultimate arbiter, the ultimate decision ought to be with the membership of that group. But, of course, the government in states like California, like our state, want to force people who happen to be, who happen to identify as religious to allow people of other faiths and other viewpoints who do not hold to the tenets of your faith, even though you've organized as a religious group, to lead your group. So maybe uh, their laws be are beginning to backfire on them. And maybe white people can be in charge of 
black groups and black rights groups. And maybe straight people can be in charge of gay rights groups. And maybe somebody who's absolutely certain of their sexual identity can lead transgender groups. And and who knows where this could all go. Maybe it's the absurdity is going to lead us back to an America where all that matters is what you actually do, not what you look like. 323-746-TALK. We've got a great show ahead. Stay tuned. If you've been listening long to the Tim Donnelly Show, you know that we talk constantly about defending freedom and about defending our natural and alienable rights. The Firearms Policy Coalition is a partner of the Tim Donnelly Show. But more than that, they're on the front lines every day in Sacramento and all across the state in the courts defending your Second Amendment right, that that is a natural right that the government merely acknowledged in the Second Amendment. If you value your freedom, then you need to join Firearms Policy Coalition. Become a member. I'm a member, and I'm happy to support an organization that is doing such an incredible job. Go to joinfpc.org. The Tim Donnelly Show sent you. Or go to timdonnellyshow.com. And click on the FPC link to make it easy. But whatever you do, join today. FPC.org. I'm still trying to decide what color I am. <laughs> well, isn't that a fair assessment? Yeah, I I mean, you can get extensions, you can get a weave. Well, I, I'm just, you know, I... Tanning beds. <laughs> I've, al- I've always uh, thought of myself as a fleshy... Uh, pinkish color uh if i was a flavor of ice cream it would be something like a cherry vanilla uh depending on how much sun i've had not peach but (laughs) no i'm yeah well maybe peach uh that 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 might work but the 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 hypocrisy goes so far on the left it it is so ludicrous that it's it's really hard to imagine how they could ever defend even such. Uh, I <laughs> I still I still want to I want to hear the answer to her question uh, when her white parents come out and say we're white, hello, and she says that's my dad. She takes a picture with a black guy. I mean, I. I can we finally get past race in America? Can can we really? And, and, and it's hard to because we're going to be talking next week to a good friend of the show, uh, Adele Nazarian, who has written a piece. And you won't believe this. Harvard University has higher standards for Asians. So the counselors at high schools are telling the Asian students, don't be so Asian. Whatever that means. I mean, do they bring wontons to school with them? I am confused. No, I, I, I don't know what it means. But, but evidently, there's a higher standard for Asians at, at Harvard University. And, and the, the, these are the people who brought us affirmative action. These are the people who thought it was acceptable to um, discriminate against people based on their race and they're doing it. The The people who 
rant and rail about discrimination are discriminating. But they're discriminating against people because... They are actually performing at a higher standard. So they've raised the bar. Well, I think it's great to raise the bar if you're going to raise the bar for everyone, not just for one race. That's just offensive, and it's ludicrous, but it's happening. And uh, we will have Adele Nazarian on to talk about that. And also, you're going to want to stay tuned because in the coming weeks, we are going to have Taya Kyle, American sniper, Chris Kyle's wife is going to be joining us on the show and talking about her new book, American Wife. And uh, and that that should be spectacular. So today, we went out to lunch with the winner of the epic contest. You remember, how, how many days did we have that thing going? Five. Five days. It took five days to find a winner and it was Denise of Victorville. And so today we went to, where'd we go? <clears throat> we went to in and out We went to the unofficial unsponsor of the show. <laughs> We're giving them so much free airtime and, and, uh, and, and so many free dollars. Uh, they should sponsor the show. But we went to, to uh, in and out and... You know, we had a great conversation and we were talking about this trade deal and she 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 could not figure out why the um what why do our representatives do this? Why why are they why are they um why don't they listen to us? What well, what's the agenda? Yeah, I think she nailed it on the head. She said uh, they don't listen to the people that they're representing. Yeah, and and, and I line. and it was it was it was really um, I realized having been on the inside of government and having gone through an election. Look, elections are hard. In in order to win an election, it usually takes a great deal of money. And it, uh, even then, the, qu- the question is, is always in question. But for, for some people, they just choose to take the easy way. And that includes a lot of Republicans who just become part of the establishment. They become part of the fabric of the building and 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 they feel that they're entitled to have a great job for life. And so when the leadership comes along and says you're going to vote for this, they vote for it. And of course, come election time, there's tons of money made available to keep them in in office. The reason the only reason that they are in office is to please and serve those same special interests. And that's why they don't fight for you. That's why they don't actually pick up the phone when you call. That's why they don't respond to your emails and your Facebook messages and your tweets. Because they don't answer to you. And we have an epidemic of this in both Sacramento. We saw it last week going up there with thousands and thousands of Californians of all stripes who said, hey, we, we, we don't want to be forced to do something by the government. What does the, what does the government do? Completely ignores them. And then works diligently to seize more and more and more control over our lives also that they can keep their job secure also that they can guarantee that their fiefdom their turf will be secure by growing it every year because you grow or die and government's growing it's not dying government is not shrinking it hasn't shrunk in years it was president ronald reagan who said the the nearest thing to eternal life on earth is a government bureau. And we are seeing this not only at the state level, 
We're now getting a front row seat. And you can determine by the vote on this TPA and on this TAA and on the toilet paper trade package and 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 all those other ones there's a million different abbreviations they have and they've got these things all cooked up and negotiated and ready to just jam them through and what they're really doing they're not solidifying the power of the people and and standing up and being your voice they are solidifying the power of a centralized government, in some cases the president himself, having outsized power, more, much more power than the founders ever envisioned. But not only that, they're ceding some of the power to foreign capitals and foreign governments and foreign entities and, and creating what is called global governance. Well, I don't want to be gl- governed by the, the globe. I like the original deal that we made with ourselves, which is we govern ourselves. We are self-governed. And those who hold positions of power rule at our consent. And, and it's that simple. That right there is what's at stake with these trade packages. That's what's at stake with the battles that are taking place in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. We are going to have, later on in the 4 o'clock hour, we're going to have an individual, Ken White. He's an attorney. He is a, 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 a former federal prosecutor, as well as a First Amendment expert who is going to be talking about how now the government has decided that they want to regulate the internet so tightly that if you go on a website and make a comment that let's say you're blowing off steam and 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 you say something outrageous and everybody knows it's outrageous you might have a department of justice prosecutor at your door dragging you off to jail before you know it because they want to suppress free speech and treat comments, political hyperbole as direct threats, as true threats. You can't make this stuff up. 323-746-TALK 323-746-8255 Hey, you've heard me talk over and over again about Burrow Canyon Shooting Park, which is arguably the greatest place on the face of the earth to exercise your Second Amendment. But it just got better. Because if you mention the Tim Donnelly Show, they'll give you free stuff. You get a free hat, free coffee cup, while supplies last if you mention Tim Donnelly Show. So get out there and get shooting. For directions or more information, call Burrow Canyon at 626 910 44. You are tuned to the Radio Free California Network. I am your host, former California State Assemblyman Tim Donnelly. Our number, our phone number, 323-746-TALK, 323-746-8255. And our website, which up until a few minutes ago was down, and the our web experts tell us we were attacked by the chinese now why would we we would be attacked by the chinese i don't know maybe i've been too outspoken on the trade deal and uh maybe the chinese are in bed with obama and you just never know with any of this stuff 
But uh, I guess we must be a threat to somebody because they took it down. So because they thought it was a threat, you should go there. TimDonnellyShow.com and check out our new live stream because if you ever miss any of one of our shows, you can just go there right after the show ends, click on Listen Live 24-7, and it will take you right to a stream where the show repeats. And it repeats over and over again until the next show starts. So, But we are back up, out from under the assault. And uh, it's, it's nice to know that, that we're getting to someone. Hey, 323-746-TALK, if you want to be part of the conversation. We're going to be talking at the top of the hour about the government takeover of the Internet, the government trying to silence your free speech, and not only your free speech, but your, your ability to complain, to talk about guns, to talk about how to make certain types of guns. Is there any aspect of our lives that they don't want to control? What? What? Why don't they? Oh, did you have something to say in there in the production booth? There's a lot, an awful lot of giggling going on today. You just can't control it, huh? You 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 really you really enjoyed that story uh, with uh, with what was her name again? Rachel the Liesel. Uh, I can't. You're you're not on air, so if you're talking. Sorry, I had to make sure I wasn't laughing anymore. Oh. Yeah, well, yeah. The the one that that uh, that claimed that she was black when in fact she's white. Um, oh, Sean gave me a new name. Oh, <laughs> I uh, am concerned about what that would be. <laughs> the Shaniquinator. Okay. Well, um, I think I like the Nascinator better. <laughs> Because you're not a pretender, <laughs> but you know all all of this all of this fixation with race is just bunk. God made each of us the way that He made us. And oh, speaking of which, the uh, politically correct crowd, of course, in California, Janet Napolitano, she is tackling another massive problem within our within our UC system. She is working on training professors to avoid using alleged microaggressions. If you don't know what microaggressions are, you probably work for a living. They, they are things that people from the victim class, people who choose to be victims, people who look for an opportunity to continuously be offended are offended by everything, including such phrases. These will now be banned for use by UC professors. America is the land of opportunity. That is offensive to those who believe they're being targeted by these microaggressions. There is only one race, the human race. Or if a professor were to say, I believe the most qualified person should get the job. That is also considered to be offensive and will be banned for professors at, in the UC system, University of California. Now, here are things, here are some other things that they cannot say. These are unacceptable. Everyone can succeed in society if they work hard enough. So they're offended by hard work. Where are you from or where were you born? Affirmative action is racist. Saying that is banned by university professors according to the college fix. And these dictates came straight out of Janet Napolitano's office. They can no longer say, when I look at you, I don't see color. 
she handed out a handout entitled Tool for Identifying Implicit Bias. Educators are told not to use the phrase raising the bar because it is considered elitist. And you wonder why California is ranked just above Alabama and Mississippi at 47th in educational results with geniuses like this running the University of California system. The University of California system used to be the envy of the world. It used to be something that was to be emulated, something to be proud of, and now it's becoming a joke. And, you know, it's funny. They they were horrified at the idea of having someone who might have worked in corporate America run one of our colleges, but it's okay to have Janet Napolitano. Go figure. And we've got Ken White coming up. Top of the hour. Stay tuned. Taken you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we hail that the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight Over the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming And the rockets red glare, the bombs bursting in air Gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave Over the land of the free and the home of the brave You know, there are times when I hate being right Yeah that, that, that is the truth. And I repeatedly talk about the government becoming and being the greatest threat to your freedom and to your future. And, and then along comes a story like this. Our next guest, Ken White, who is a partner at Brown, White, and Osborne in L.A. He's a former federal prosecutor, currently a criminal defense attorney and First Amendment litigator. He wrote an article about basically political blowhard speech being deemed a true threat by the Department of Justice. And uh, you can't make this stuff up. So I'm going to let Ken, explain what happened. Ken, welcome to the Tim Donnelly Show. Well, thank you very much for having me on, Tim. My pleasure. I mean, I I read this article. And I just I couldn't believe it. So, uh, take us through just just a quick history of what got these comments um, under the skin of the Department of Justice. Sure. This was about the prosecution of Ross Ulbricht. You might have heard of him as the Dread Pirate Roberts. He's a guy who ran a website called Silk Road. And Silk Road was basically a illegal marketplace for just about anything you wanted, including a whole lot of drugs. That's what the federal government prosecuted him for. He was recently sentenced uh, to life in federal prison. And a lot of people had complaints about the case. Those complaints really centered on the idea that, you know, we put a lot of murderers and rapists in prison for considerably less time. Are we really using America's resources right when we put in somebody who's doing something like this in for life in federal prison? Right. He's got no possibility of parole, right? Uh, Yeah. Federal prison has no parole, and so if you're in there for life, you leave in a box. Wow. Um, So... One of the places where people were writing about this and following the story was on Reason Magazine. Reason's a libertarian site, and they have a website with a pretty big following. And they wrote an article really showing one of uh, Ross Ulbricht's letters to the judge pleading for mercy. His plea was basically, I know you're going to put me in for a long time, but let me have my old age. Let me get out someday. A plea that wasn't listened to. 
And in the course of people commenting on that article, some people acted, I would describe it the way people act on the Internet, like jerks. Yeah. All right? People said things like, it's judges like these that should be taken out back and shot. Or, why waste ammunition? Uh, wood chippers get the message across clearly. Now, I'm not in favor of this sort of thing. I try to avoid it. I only occasionally uh, indulge in it. Uh, but it's very clearly not a real threat to right. attack anyone. Ken, every one, not- of us, every one of us knows that those individuals are blowing off steam. It's political hyperbole. It, it, it's idiotic, stupid comments, but it, but they're not saying we're going to show up at such and such an address and kill this judge. Correct. And there have been cases like that that were correctly prosecuted. But in this case, it was clearly people blowing off steam, just as if you said something like, you know, everyone in Congress should be swinging at the end of the rope. It may not be a particularly bright sentiment, but it's clearly not a threat. But what happened was somebody decided to take it as a threat. And a source sent to me a federal grand jury subpoena issued by the federal prosecutors in Manhattan, the same office that was prosecuting Ron. And that was a subpoena to Reason Magazine telling them that it wanted all of their data about these particular commenters. And not just ones who said things the judge should be taken out and shot, including ones who said things that are just so clearly not threats, like, I hope there's a special place in hell reserved for that horrible woman. Right. Now, I think there's one entity who can condemn people to hell, uh, Tim, and I don't think God comments on reason hit and run. Uh, (laughs) Well, maybe the government thinks they're God. Right. So they're looking for the IP addresses or email addresses or any other trace these commenters left on reason. And they issued this subpoena. It was leaked to me, and I decided to write about it because I write a lot about free speech issues and criminal justice issues, and this was at the intersection. What you might be amazed to know is that even though these are very clearly not true threats, if you went into court with them, the judge would dismiss them. Uh, If you got convicted on them, it would be overturned on appeal. Even though they're not clear threat, they're not true threats on their face. The government can still subpoena your information. The government can still seek to pierce your anonymity as a commenter to find out who you are, because courts have said, well, generally we want to protect the First Amendment. Generally we want to protect anonymity, but uh, letting the government investigate any threat, I guess, is a compelling interest. Well, and and that's really the crux of this thing. Because it, 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 this isn't about Obama and his Department of, o- of Justice. This is about justice. This is about freedom of speech. This is about abuse of power. Because they're, they're literally suppressing free speech. And, and in particular, political speech. Because these, these ranters, these, these individuals who have made these comments, however horrific you may find them are talking about what they consider to be an abuse of power, even though they may not be using language you would agree with. Yeah, and frankly, I think that the war on drugs is a lot more outrageous than a couple of uh, Internet hotheads ranting about it. But you're right. It's not about any particular president. This is about the power of the government, whoever's holding the reins, to go after who they want to go after. So, Tim, the danger isn't that... Every single one of us who makes intemperate comments on the Internet is going to get tracked down with a grand jury subpoena. The danger is that the government is going to use its discretion and its power to go after the particular people it wants to go after. Now, if I were a betting man, I would bet that the reason these people are being, uh, their identity is being sought is not because their comments were particularly outrageous, not because they stand out out of the ocean of bad behavior on the Internet every day, but because someone in this judge's chambers read it and mentioned it to the judge, and the judge put in a call to the U.S. attorney. And, well, when a federal judge puts in a call to the U.S. attorney, they tend to get what they want. And, and, and that, that right there is, is, is chilling. Yes, because, Tim, I'm sure people say intemperate things about you on the Internet. <laughs> but let me yeah. tell you, no one's going to give a grand jury subpoena to find out about them for you. 
Well, nor uh, what, nor would I want them to. I, I am like, absolutely a believer in free speech, even if you're trashing me. That's fine. I've got lots of haters. We, we've had people form their own hate club. I guess I must be a threat now to the Chinese. Just before you came on air, they took my entire website down. That's never happened. Oh, and wow. and uh, we were able to get it back up and, and trace down who was hacking it. But, I mean, the, the, this really goes to... It, and we're seeing this. I, I don't think people really paid attention when the government took over the Internet a couple months ago. But they literally now have the ability to clamp down. We know that they're looking to, to ban any kind of gun talk, as, as they call it. Here they're going after political speech or, um, you know, basically people's opinions. And, and, and very poorly expressed in, in a um, <laughs> sort of... <laughs> A teenage, immature, um, uh, you know, uh, frat house type way. Um, But nonetheless, free speech, once you start down that slope, I mean, isn't this the slippery slope? I think it is. And, And let me say, I think it is possible to investigate and prosecute things that we would agree are genuine threats. There was a white supremacist back east who posted the names and addresses of three judges he didn't like and told them, you know, the last judges who disagreed with people like me got killed, as they had, and said people should go here and kill these judges. Now, that was a very specific threat with uh, showing where they were, pointing out other instances of judges being killed, and suggesting that this person's readers go kill the judges. That was a threat. That was a true threat. Right. This is nothing near that. And no. what we need, I think, is for uh, to wish that prosecutors would ex- exercise a little more discretion and perhaps a little more backbone in standing up to someone powerful when they call you and ask you to fill out a grand jury subpoena. Well, and and look, the comments are not a threat to those individuals who hold those seats of power. But when they turn that power back on the people, that is a true threat to freedom freedom of speech everywhere. And this I agree. And it's the discretion given to people like the prosecutors to decide which intemperate speech is going to get suppressed and, and which isn't. Now, this isn't yet a prosecution. They're just trying to find the identity. But, you know, anonymous speech is part of American life. It's part of American heritage, and it should be protected. Well, sure. Didn't Benjamin Franklin write under an anonymous pen name? Yes, I think it was Silas Duguid. And I'll be honest with you, Tim, and tell you I only know that from the movie National Treasure and not from actual study. (laughs) No, you sounded really intelligent. We were all impressed. (laughs) So, hey, uh, uh, most can, things I know from Nick Cage movies. Um, <laughs> can I hold you over for right. a quick break? Absolutely. Okay. Hey, we are talking with Ken White, who is a First Amendment litigator, former prosecutor, and defender of free speech. And we'll be right back after this break. Stay tuned. I'm Barack Obama, and I don't always listen to talk radio. But when I do, it's the Tim Donnelly Show. Okay, if you're just tuning in to the Tim Donnelly Show, we stream live at timdonnellyshow.com. We're talking with Ken White, an attorney from Los Angeles who fights free speech cases. He got a tip that the Department of Justice may actually decide to go after 
internet commenters. That's people who write comments. And, and if you've ever been on a newspaper or blog website where comments are made, the most outrageous, hyperbolic, and insane things are regularly stated. Um, and you obviously have to ignore the vast majority of it. Uh, but they've decided to subpoena Reason.com's users in order to investigate whether or not these are true threats. And I think the greater threat is the government having that kind of power and not the discretion to that's commensurate with such absolute power. Ken, um, you you are aware as well. I mean, they the gun control freaks, the ones who believe that if you just penalize law-abiding citizens enough, then somehow you will prevent murder um, by gun. And they they are now fixated at the federal government level on forbidding what is called gun talk to be broadcast on the internet where where you can talk about how to make a gun at home and without the government knowing it and it, 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 where does it stop you know tim i i looked at that one and i'll i'll be honest with you I, this may fall under the category of never attribute to malice what you can be explained by incompetence or functional illiteracy. Uh, what you're referring to, I think, is some proposed changes to a law restricting international arms trafficking. And some of the new language that the administration has pushed, you could read as saying that you're not allowed to release into the public record, like out on a website, information, technical information about firearms. If they meant to do that, and if it gets interpreted that way, I think it's pretty clearly unconstitutional and would be overturned uh, pretty quickly. Um, I don't think there's any way to restrict the populace from talking at least the basic facts about guns. But, you know, the regulation does carve out basic facts and I, I, looking at it, I think it's really just an example of the government not being able to draft clear laws. And that's almost as bad in some ways as uh, deliberate oppression. You know, we have a huge thicket of federal laws and a huger array of federal regulations. And, you know, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I interpret law for a living. I'm okay at it. And if I spend two hours trying to figure out whether or not a law bans a particular type of speech and I can't figure it out, I feel pretty good saying that it's hard to figure out. We're in trouble. Then. Uh, so I, I think uh, I don't know yet. I'm not satisfied yet whether this new regulation is actually going to do what the NRA and some other groups have been warning about. I do know that even if it doesn't, it's a great example of how the law is drafted in a way that is inaccessible for 99 percent of the populace. Yeah, I, I mean we've got a we've got a, a big deal today in Washington D.C. with a a trade deal that I, I've looked at some of the language in this 800 page trade deal that was leaked out. It's virtually impossible to understand unless you really have a legal mind and you can read legalese. Um, it, it it requires massive amounts of interpretation. And I, I, obviously, I, I think that's by design because they want to obfuscate a, a number of the provisions. And, you know, it, it's like, do they forget they rule at our consent? That Right. You know, there's a long-standing legal doctrine that ignorance of the law is no excuse. But that doctrine and the justice of it, if there is any, relies on the idea that you can know what the law is, that a normal person can figure out what is prohibited. And it is increasingly hard under federal law and many state laws to figure out what you're not allowed to do. And that's even when you've got expensive lawyers trying to figure it out for you. And when that's the case, particularly when you have so many thousands of laws that 
you know, the government can't prosecute them all. They're going to pick and choose and use them in their discretion. It's really chilling to Americans, particularly when the laws have anything to do with speech. If you can't figure out exactly what's prohibited for you to say or do, then you're really going to be worried. You know, I might win eventually. Uh, the case against me might be dismissed. Maybe no one will use their discretion to go after me. But, boy, this law, badly written, confusing, sure worries me. And that's how people's speech is chilled. Yeah, and, and that's the very speech that was intended to be protected, was political speech in particular. Um, we have a long-standing tradition in this country of criticizing the government. I do it now for a living, and... Um, you know, the the idea that the government has the ability already to spy on us and, and record conversations and, and record everything we do online, on our phones, uh, without very much um, oversight or any oversight in, in many cases, um, it, just, it just seems insane for them then to go out there and either try to silence commenters on the Internet or try to keep certain types of documents off because... That there's a free exchange of ideas. I, I, you cannot control everything. No, you can't. And the government's not even going to try. There are too many things to control. There are too few federal prosecutors and, thankfully, too many Americans. But the danger remains when those few federal prosecutors can pick and choose and decide when they're going to issue these grand jury subpoenas, usually on behalf of the powerful. Uh, to to do what they want, to go after the type of speech that they wish to. And and it's not lost, uh, I think, on most people that have ever been to a website like Reason.com because they do a lot of really great work exposing the government and, uh, in, in many different ways. And, uh, you know, I, I there's just a part of me that feels that it wasn't just by accident that they went after them. You know, honestly, I, I think it's probably just a matter of this is what rose to the attention of someone who could make a call to the U.S. attorney. The reason, like you said, is well known. It's respected among lawyers and young lawyers. Again, having been a law clerk and a federal prosecutor, if I were a betting man, I'd say some law clerk in this judge's chambers regularly reads it, read it this time, showed it to the judge, and the judge made a call. Ken, thanks for coming on with us today. It was Ken White. Don't you think it's about time you treat yourself or someone you love to something very special? Well, Ozell Jewelers, the finest jewelry store in the high desert, is known throughout the high desert for having the largest variety of fine-looking jewelry and gifts for every special occasion. Ozell custom designs and manufactures their own jewelry, so you'll be able to find exclusive, one-of-a-kind, stunning styles you won't find anywhere else in Southern California. If you're looking for fine jewelry at unbeatable prices, Ozell Jewelers is the place to go. Show appreciation to that special person in your life with something special to cherish forever. Ozell Jewelers, voted best jewelers in the high desert by the Daily Press regularly for years. Ozell Jewelers has been putting smiles on high desert faces for over 30 years. Ozell Jewelers, in Rancho Cucamonga, Palm Desert, and Amargosa Road by Red Lobster in Victorville. Ozell Jewelers. You're tuned to the Radio Free California Network. I am your host, Tim Donnelly, former California State Assemblyman and Governor candidate. And we are... I'm curious what you think of, of all this. I, I would love to get your take. I, I, we got the Noskinator's take. She, As soon as she sees the story, she can't stop laughing at the absurdity but i would love to get your take 323-746-TALK on 
a white person impersonating a black person in order to become a black leader. And it, it just boggles the mind, but maybe somebody can explain it to me out there in the hinterland of California. Um, later on in today's show, we are going to have a real treat. We're going to be talking to Corey Zamora and Dr. Tomas Martinez about Manuel Zamora, who is known as the gunsmith to the stars. And this story will take you all over the place from Pancho Villa to Al Capone to Hollywood and all points in between. And you definitely will not want to miss it when we get some of their insights and stories. Um, a really extraordinary life of someone that I'd never heard of. And they sent me a copy of the book. I, I'm halfway through it. So I'm going to find out things probably that I haven't even read yet. But you don't want to miss that coming up in the in the five o'clock hour. And as I told you, later on in June, we're going to have Taya Kyle, American Sniper's, uh, Chris Kyle's wife, I'm sorry, a widow, is going to be joining the Tim Donnelly show. And she's got a powerful story. You know, if, did you have you seen that movie? Oh, yeah, I've seen it three times. Wow. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, to me, it's a love story based in a background of, of war, and you get to see what our warriors go through, but more importantly, you get to see what the families go through. Yeah, I think it, uh, along with that, it, it barely touched the surface of what actually goes on with your family, and um, when he comes back and his PTSD and all of that, I mean, it's really sad. Yeah, and and I think a, a lot of American families right now can relate to that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting in depth with Taya Kyle because um, she's she's even written a new book, American Wife, and uh, and so we'll be talking about that later on this month. So you're going to have to stay tuned. And by the way, if you're not signed up for our emails, you need to go to timdonnellyshow.com. Sign up, subscribe, get on our list because, we, and we we don't we won't overwhelm you with emails. We send about one one a week, and um, they're very informative. And I know that you want to know what's happening and and what's affecting your life, particularly in the issues that we tend to cover on this show, which is going to be your freedom which always somehow winds up coming back to guns every time. And you might notice that some of the sponsors of the show, like uh, Firearms Policy Coalition, they fight on our gun rights. We have Turner's, who also uh, you know, supplies firearms and ammunition. We have Burrow Canyon Shooting Park, which is probably the greatest place in Southern California to go shooting, at least if you want to make a day of it and have an adventure but um yeah it's it's um it's going to be it, it's going to be a a good month for the tim donnelly show um another story that i want to touch on did you see that headline that the obama administration wants to quote unquote diversify wealthy neighborhoods by putting housing projects in them. That's no. a no. 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 <laughs> you know, I the the more and more I see these housing urban development and uh, you know, you could stretch it all the way out to the EPA where where the EPA wants to take over every mud puddle in your backyard. Well, the housing and urban development, it's not enough to try to provide affordable housing, which has been an epic disaster. Anytime housing and urban development is developing housing or building a project, it, 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 it 
takes property values down and it creates a crime zone. That's just a fact. And you, then they, they came up with a new idea, which is called Section 8, where they go into neighborhoods that don't have any so-called affordable housing and they rent houses and, and basically the government's paying the rent. So you have people who... My wife and I went to look at renting a house and it, it was a cool house. The only problem was that next door there were three young men who were sitting on the porch drinking beer because the government's paying for their rent. The government's paying for their food. The government's paying for everything. They don't have to work. And I don't want to live next to young males with that kind of time on their hands and, and alcohol. And it's just a recipe for a disaster. So, of course, what happens to a neighborhood like that? Nobody wants to live in it. But Obama wants to force the so-called diversification of wealthy neighborhoods let me let me say that in a slightly different way. This is the federal government's assault on private property rights. Because last time I checked, as a free American, I get to live wherever I damn well please. That That's just an American right. But when you get activists in office like Barack Obama who doesn't want to uphold and secure the first principles of this country, doesn't want to secure the inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How, how do you pursue happiness when the government is continually interfering in your life? When the government is continually interfering in your business? When the government will not only not leave your property alone, but literally seeks to harm your property values. I mean, the ownership of private property was once considered by the founders to be one of the inalienable rights in, in place of pursuit of happiness. And, you know, if, if you go out and buy, you buy a home, you know, someday, uh, I'm sure you will go out and buy your own home and you'll and you'll get married, settle down, have kids, Right, And you're going to pick the neighborhood you want to live in. And you're going to pick the price that you want to pay or you can afford. But there, there's a lot of things that you might consider important. Like the school district. Like uh, how much crime there is in the neighborhood, right? Of course. So, but, but, I, but I'm not somebody that walks around that feels entitled. It's a different... Well, yeah, because but it, but if the government moves into that neighborhood and says we're going to f take a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house and we're going to make it available to somebody who we believe has historically been discriminated against, and we're going to make sure that they can buy a house for one hundred and fifty thousand in a two hundred fifty thousand dollar neighborhood, well. That, that's no longer free market. That's government interference, and that's government literally threatening your property values. Because once the government does that, then people might say, hey, I, this isn't the deal I struck. I'm getting out of here. And when people get out of town, property values plummet. You might have made a huge investment. You're stuck with it for 30 years. You have to pay off the mortgage. Well, on the flip side, then what's the incentive to working hard and going to work every day and having a good job and raising your family? Then what's the incentive to do that? Well, you get to pay for the people who live off the government. <laughs> Sorry. Exactly. I don't know how else to say it. It's yeah. just, and, and, and I think more and more Americans are getting tired of this kind of insanity. But this is the president that Paul Ryan who we now refer to as Nancy Pelosi in drag, wants to give absolute power to to strike trade deals. He wants to give him absolute, unchecked executive power to negotiate deals here in in this day and age, knowing what we know 
about this president. And that that's the part I don't get. Do, do the Republicans not understand what they were sent there to do in Washington, D.C.? Do they not understand? They were sent there to stop the insanity. And at the time, the, the two big ones were the executive amnesty and, and Obamacare. We're going to take a quick call here. Hey, welcome to the Tim Donnelly Show. Hey, Tim. Great show. I've been listening since day one. Oh, awesome. Where are you, where are you I calling just, from? I, I live in Chino, California. Oh, great. But I just want to tell you, I don't call them politicians anymore. I call them political terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's a good one, huh? Yes, sir. Very fitting. It is. I mean, right, Tim, thank you. Yeah. You, you, no, thank you. I mean, that you know what? I love that. A succinct caller that that identified the clear threat, absolute threat to property values, to um, our fundamental rights. We're going to take uh, one more call. Hey, welcome to the Tim Donnelly Show. Yeah, welcome to the Tim Donnelly Show. Sorry, I just uh, clicked the wrong button. Okay, hi, Tim. It's Kevin from Torrance. Hey, Kevin, how are you? No, all right. I I, I, I want to uh, pipe in on, on your, your statement. You, you're kind of skating around an issue that you're you're talking about. You know, you're, you're talking about... Me skating? Uh, yeah. Never. Yeah, never, going. never, never. Okay. So now when you're talking about people moving in and how they're going to lower the property value, they're going to lower the property value because they are what? Because Four? they are dependent on government. Because they well, are... How does... That lower, well, how does, how does if, if the government is paying part of their rent, and that's what Section 8 does, right? Okay. How does that, how does that in of itself lower the property value? Well, that they doesn't... Pay that to, they pay that to the landlord, and the other person pays the rest of the, whatever the rest of the rent is. How does that in of itself lower your property value? Well, the government paying your rent for you doesn't in and of itself lower the property values. The reaction well, of the homeowners to individuals who are now in the neighborhood who are committing... They, how do they identify these individuals? Uh, I don't know, but but I all I can do is tell you my own experience. Okay, when, what's, what's, your, what's basically saying is that if they do Section 8, they're going to bring more lower-class minorities into that area. No, I didn't say that. You're saying that. What I said is my wife and I looked at a beautiful home. It was, okay. was picture-perfect inside. It had a beautiful right. exterior. The only mm -hmm. problem was almost every home in the neighborhood was up for rent. The entire neighborhood had been vacated as if a bomb had gone off. And right next door, there were three young men in their teens at 4 o'clock in the afternoon drinking. And, and, and we found out later that the government had come in and turned it into a Section 8 neighborhood. And you know what? I never even had to even talk to my wife about whether or not we were going to settle there because I don't want to live next door to three young men who are drinking and able to do so because the government's paying the bill. Kevin, I want to hold you okay. over because yeah. i got to take a break. So just hang on. More of this discussion when we get back. 323-746-TALK if you want to weigh in. If you're just tuning in, we are talking with Kevin from Torrance, and we were having a discussion about 
President Barack Obama's new push to actually build government-subsidized low-income housing in wealthier neighborhoods. And, uh, Kevin, you were making the point that... Well, go ahead. Make your point. Okay. Well, okay. So Now, you said that you don't want to be around a place where, you know, you pull in and, and these kids, that are, are, these teenagers aren't working and they're drinking. Uh, let me tell you, I went to school to, at Chadwick up in Palos Verde, one top prep school, okay? There is more drinking and drugs at the prep schools than there are at the local, at, at the more impoverished. Yeah, but but we're not talking about that because because what you're talking. You're talking I'm asking what. Okay, my, my point is, is I'm talking about government interfering hospital. in the private sector, government coming in after you've already bought your home and made an investment, and 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 let's let's be clear. If you want to come on and, and defend projects, the projects were a disaster. They hurt the people who lived in them. We had Nick Ferguson on this show, who was a safety for the uh, Denver Broncos. And he stated, I don't know if if, uh, if you can roll that clip. Do you have that clip? Or you don't have it? All right. Well, I'll just, I'll just tell you what he said. What, what he said was, my mother got up early, went to work, and the only thing that saved me was when she moved us out of the projects, got off government assistance. If she hadn't done that, hadn't made all those sacrifices, I wouldn't be in the NFL. Okay. H- have you looked at the statistics lately about what's changed in the last 30 years with the separation of, of, of income and the fact that most people um, are actually making less than they made before? And well, how much- we, we, have, we have transferred $50 trillion, $52 trillion and in, in tr- wealth transfers, redistribution of income in the battle to combat poverty. And all it's done is make the poverty advocates and the poverty industry individuals, those who, who run it, the what I call the poverty industry um, establishment, wealthy. But poor people will always be with us, and well, that, always, that's the bottom always, line. There's always going to be poor. But if you look at I'm not talking about the poor. I'm talking about the 10% of our middle class we lost. And, oh, yeah. You know, no, it, 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 it's, that's not lost on me. Okay. Okay. So we lost ten percent of our middle class. Okay, and our and our upper class has, all, has, has taken it all. It hasn't gone to the lower class. It's the upper class that has all the money now. It's just been shifted to that ten and one percent. Well, the, you can't you, you can't you cannot shift wealth from the poor to the wealthy. That that doesn't work. No, we, no, you, no. You take it from the middle class. Is what happened. Well, it, 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 Kevin, it Kevin, you you have a bad correct? you have a bad habit of calling in when we don't have enough time. We will continue this discussion another time because I think it's a fruitful one, but we are up against a break. Thanks for calling in. Okay. Um, Look, we've got Manuel Zamora's life story coming up. You will not want to miss this. Hey, if you like shooting as much as I do, you've probably been to a lot of ranges. Unless you visited Burrow Canyon Shooting Park, you've never seen anything like it. On the way there, you'll find yourself taking pictures as you traverse the majestic Azusa Canyon and wind your way up into the Angeles National Forest. With over 600 acres, including 19 private ranges, there's something for everyone. There's rifle and pistol ranges for beginners, right up to advanced shooters. And there's plenty of spaces to shoot sporting clay. You can make a family day of it, or you can bring a group for team building exercises. Bring a picnic lunch. On the weekends, they provide lunch. And don't worry, they always have ammo in case you forget yours or run out. One thing I can guarantee is that once you visited my friends at Burrow Canyon Shooting Park, you'll be hooked and you'll keep coming back. BurrowCanyon.com is their website, or call them at 626 626- Nine one zero one three four four six two six nine one zero thirteen forty four. Pour me something tall and strong. Make it a hurricane before I go insane. It's only half past twelve, but I don't care. It's five o'clock somewhere. It is 5 o'clock 
somewhere. It's 5.06 here. And that means that we're going to have an interesting conversation about something that's not necessarily political. And today, I, I've been trying to come up with a headline for my post. And I've come up with, from facing a Pancho Villa firing squad to working for Al Capone's predecessor... The fascinating journey of Manuel Zamora to eventually becoming the gunsmith to the stars. And we are going to be joined by Dr. Tomas Martinez and Manuel Zamora's only daughter, Corey Zamora. Hey, welcome to the Tim Donnelly Show. Well, thank you. Happy to be on. (laughs) It's great to have you guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, I've been reading this book you sent me, and I have never read such an amazing story. It it is. You know what makes it even more amazing is that he never really spoke about it. I had to draw everything out and go through tons of pictures that had nothing written on them. It was just his job, and that makes it even more amazing. Well, let's let's introduce you. Um, so, Corey, you, this you're Corey Zamora. This is book is about your father. Yes, sir. And um, and then uh, uh, Tomas, what is your connection to all of it? I know you did a lot of the writing, but well, I, I was Corey's and still am uh, her producer, producing uh, some various uh, dance instructional. Uh, DVDs, uh, and uh, she would mention her father every now and then, and me being a writer, uh, you know, I kept asking more questions, I said, wow, this interesting person, and I said, I said Corey, let's, why don't we do a book about your father, and one thing led to another, one uh, turned over stone led to another treasure trove of information and insight into not only the use of guns in movies, and uh, how he happened to, you know, be proficient of that. And, but also early Hollywood, you know, what, what was going on there and his journey through immigration. It took him 10 years to become a citizen. And even then it took Howard Hughes to vouch for him because in the 1930s, uh, we weren't allowing immigration. Yeah. And, and by the way, that's an important point. It was actually yeah. immigration because um, but but we're getting ahead in the story because I, 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 right. I yeah. be, before I before I launch into uh in into that um i was really struck by uh his upbringing so here's this young man who um his parents want him to go off and be a doctor and he goes to medical school for a while he was bored (laughs) <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting for one of you to jump in. Okay, so he was bored. He was bored. And then what did he, he was do? Extra, so they wanted him to be a surgeon. Yeah, and then he did something absolutely like really out of uh, uh, character for for the character that he became. Um, he pulled a stunt. Which look, it, it, my uh, my theory is if you don't pull a stunt when you're in college of some sort, then you're probably not going to be a very interesting character. He went <laughs> he went way above and beyond. And, uh, and I mean, no to him. And it's amazing he didn't get contaminated. <laughs> well, we got to say what he did. What he did is he carried, uh, he, he went in the basement of the hospital and carried up 12 corpses and put them in the beds, the hospital beds, and, uh, you know, and, and, and wanted to s- hide and watch the reaction of the nurses. He just wanted to shock, shock and awe. And uh, boy, did he ever get shock and awe because they threw him out of medical school, right? Yes, because the corpses were from smallpox. Yeah, and he didn't know that. So, no, he didn't. You know, he was lucky he didn't <laughs> contract it. And, and uh, if he exactly. had, there, there would be no story. But... Um, so he's he gets thrown out of medical school, goes home. He he knows his parents are going to be upset, and uh, and and decides that um, he's going to join the army because there's a revolution on. 
And yes, and he wanted to fly planes, and he knew they would teach him how to fly a plane. And and, and so he goes he he, he goes to. Um, to training and he and he winds up becoming an officer and he's on he's on a train right after his training and lo and behold uh the train gets stopped by none other than Pancho Villa <laughs> but that was his friend <laughs> yeah so i always wondered if his family knew about that uh knew about what that who his friends were but I think when you see the pictures of his parents, my grandparents, um, you can see how stern and Victorian. I can see the rebellion, what what he was going against. Yeah, and, but but the the train is stopped. There's these huge boulders uh, pushed in front of the train, and and Pancho Villa and and three hundred of his soldiers are shooting at the train because it's it's filled with what two hundred soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. For the federal, the the federal government of of Mexico, the federal soldiers, and the federales, the federales. Yes, thank you. And and so they take them out, and uh, the the general thinks if uh, who is commanding these young men that if he just surrenders since they're outnumbered, uh, that perhaps they'll be have their lives spared. And he couldn't have been more wrong because almost all of them were executed, but somehow your father survived. He was facing a firing squad. They're getting ready to pull the trigger. And what happens? He's pulled over the wall. Pulled over the wall. And this happens three times by either side. Pancho Villa's men saving him from Federales. Federales saving him from Pancho Villa. Well, yeah. And one of it, and a friend stood up for him and distracted the whole thing. And, and uh, he, yes. he wound up having his life spared um, and then later tried to spare the life of his friend and was unsuccessful. Um, but he survived three firing squads and, and, and winds up um, deciding <laughs> after, after his uh, stint in the Army that he'd like to go to America. Yes. And uh, so in terms of uh, of his decision, it was it was very interesting the language that he uses because he he strikes me and, and Corey, you tell me was he was he as formal as he looks in his pictures? He's always well dressed, wearing sort of a suit and tie, unless he's you know poured over a machine. Yes, he he was formal. You remember he was born in the late eighteen hundreds, and it was still very much the Victorian moray of everything. He was very formal and proper with such things like that. But when you got him going, he could be a rounder, <laughs> you know? So there was like two sides, not much of a gray, black or white. I more see. More black or white. I see. Um, if you're just tuning in, we're talking about Manuel Zamora. The book is called Gunsmith to the Stars. And we have on the phone with us his daughter, Corey Zamora, and his biographer, Dr. Tomas Martinez. Um, and we're, we're going to take a quick break, and then uh, we'll come back with more of this story about how he came to America and eventually to Hollywood. Stay tuned. Sydney, Australia with Tim Donnelly. He gets caught up at security. The TSA don't follow me. Tea parties are this 40 mags by the scones. I'm fighting for gun rights to shoot in, in his dome. <laughs> Click from hills is no place like home. Cock back and blast off. If you're just tuning in, we are talking with 
And talking about Manuel Zamora in in his fascinating life, which took him from facing firing squads three times to working for Al Capone's predecessor to eventually becoming Hollywood's gunsmith to the stars. And we have on the phone with us his daughter, Corey Zamora, and Dr. Tomas Martinez, who both of whom uh, contributed to writing this book. And, and I'm only halfway through the book, which I I, I know you're going to have to give away some of the, the stuff, but I was blown away. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. You know, you asked me about his formality and how he's spoke when he started losing his hearing testing bombs for Hughes but I think he was trying so hard to learn English that he totally forgot any of his Spanish and he spoke Castilian Spanish which no one would understand in America today really so he was sort of lost in this this uh, bunched, bunched up by a bunch of languages and le- he taught himself English from a dictionary uh, and then losing his hearing when he hadn't fully gotten rid of the, his accent, so it was it, he was sort of um, he, he was sort of a loner. Well, he he, he was certainly fascinating in terms of um, he he made this decision along with his friend uh, Xavier to come to the United States. Yes, Xavier Gonzalez, who is a, a renowned painter, um, most I think he is big claim to fame is in the Southwest. But yes, he came with him, and and he 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 decided he absolutely wanted to come through the proper channels, get a visa, go through the checkpoint, be recorded, because he wanted to become a U.S. citizen. And it, and it was strange yes. that he made this decision before he ever got to America. And I think it it speaks a lot about his character and who he is. Um, but boy, when he got here, it wasn't. Uh, it certainly wasn't an easy road. Because no, but it all sort of fell into place. Well, one of the first a things bumpy road, but it fell into place. Yeah, one of the first bumps in the road. He went. He wanted to go to a restaurant and eat, and the sign said, uh, "No, no Negroes, no something else, and and no Mexicans." Dogs. No dogs. No okay, dogs. Yeah. No Mexicans. Yes. And, and uh, you know, I thought that, especially given some of the ridiculous stories that we've covered today and, and how race has just overwhelmed America and crippled America because people are so obsessed with it. He, he Xavier says, hey, maybe we shouldn't go in there, right? Which is a normal reaction. You don't want to go where you're not wanted. But your right. dad said, hey... I faced three firing squads. I'm not afraid of anything. And if anything happens, I'm I'm armed. So he obviously believed in the Second Amendment. And he says, let's just go in. So they go inside. And it turns out that the husband was all, uh, you know, some grumpy uh, cook who was pissed off at the world. But the wife didn't even know he had put that sign back up. She apologized and treated them with respect. Made that first move, yes. Yeah, which which wouldn't have happened if they never went through the door. Exactly. exactly. You know, and and, and 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 the reason I make that point is because through the prism of that experience of having the courage and and understanding that life is not going to be this this uh, you know flat, beautiful, paved with gold pathway to success. Um, your dad. It really embodies the American dream and the in sort of a story of an uh, of an American life, even though he came from Mexico, of going from nothing to doing very very well by hard work, by integrity, and by and by the character that he lived his life. Well, yes, and that he left great wealth because his family came initially from Samora, Spain, but they built and owned all the textile mills that are still in Puebla today. So he had he had his own cook because he did not like the cook that the family had. He left all of that to be himself. Well, and it was funny. His first job, he winds up working as a pilot because he had been trained in the Army. He winds up working as a pilot 
for none other than this this uh, uh, outfit. Colosimo. Boss. Yeah, what was yeah. his name? Big Jim Colosimo. Yeah, Jim Colosimo, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Big Jim Colosimo, uh, who... That's it. And he didn't realize he was working for the outfit. He just knew that these guys were pretty serious about security, and uh, and he winds up, uh, his boss gets killed, and the replacement, which was the second in command, a guy named John Torrio, but then next thing you know, Al Capone is in is in the outfit, and uh, and and he he he, your dad got out of town when he figured out that these guys were gangsters, moving booze and, and guns. And using oh, him yeah. to he, fly him. He figured him. it out in a plane. Yeah, he figured it out in a plane, and he saw. He finally looked to see what was in the plane that he was flying back and forth from Canada, and he blew it up and walked away. Yeah, and and that was smart because they they would have killed him, and and so then he decides yeah. he he he's absolutely fixated on becoming an American citizen. He wants to make this his home. He wants to belong, and he understands that they make it really really hard to become a citizen. And he asked, well, how are there any ways that I could improve my odds of becoming a citizen? And they said, go in the Army. And he told him about his, his abilities. And next thing you know, he's in the U.S. Army uh, with a focus on the Air Corps. And, and they send him out to Iowa. And before he knows it, um, not only is he the, the, the base's best mechanic and everything else, but he winds up in a movie, on a movie set. Yes. And and yeah, that was uh, that was when he was in Texas. Oh, was that Texas? I'm filming. sorry. Yeah, yes, they were filming because the, the wings. yeah because the port the port that his ticket allowed him to come into the country legally the port was from in Texas. And to this day, I meet other Zamoras. That we wonder if we're related, but they say well, I don't understand why my family's in Texas. And I said, well, I know my father had to come in through Texas. That was the port of entry at the time. And that's well, where he met Howard Hughes with his tool company. Sure. And, but before he met Howard Hughes, he, he's, he's there at the, uh, on, the, on the set. And, um, and, and, and it's a big, huge movie set. And, and the, the, the uh, producer asked the general if, if he had anybody who was uh, well, knowledgeable in armaments. And in addition to being a pilot, your your dad was this genius with firearms and explosives and everything else. And it was funny because it was this one moment on set where uh, after they, they drafted your dad in and brought him in, um, he really made himself the premier expert on everything to do with armaments when the director said, hey, We've got all these firearms guys. I want to do a little contest and see how fast they can put together. He took apart six machine guns made in six different countries. And he said, I want to, I, I want to see how fast you can put them back together. None of the other guys could even finish assembling them. Your dad did it, did it in record time, and, and brought, got the attention of, of Cary Grant and Howard Hughes and a whole bunch of others that thought, wow, this guy is the real deal. That sounds real correct. And, <laughs> and and the beautiful thing about that is, can, can, I feel like I'm more excited about the story than you guys. <laughs> oh, no, I, oh. I'm just fascinated. I'm fascinated in listening to you Me talk too. about it and your, your joy and enjoyment. I mean, we wrote it, and we've never really, I, you know, we were talking to someone who read it and loved it, and we're t- thoroughly enjoying it. Listening to you, I mean, I'm in, I've got tears. I mean, I, I've got tears. Oh, because good. Someone put so much thought into this. Well, I and and if you're just tuning in, we're talking about a new book. It's called Manuel Zamora, Gunsmith to the Stars. The authors are Miss Ms. Corey Zamora and Doctor Tomas Martinez, who are on the phone with us. And and can you guys hold over for another break? Sure, sure. can. Okay, because we're, we're going to have one coming up here real quick. But you got to get this book, and, and, and not only the writing, but the pictures. And, and part of what I liked about yeah. the writing is I can tell you, you, you bring him right into the room, and I feel like I really got to know him and his thoughts, and, and, and came, I'm only halfway through the book, and I yeah, came to... That was to, the whole idea, to get the reader involved with him. Uh, people don't read books like that uh, because they don't, they don't make too many books like that. 
Well, you guys did a great job, and uh, we will continue talking about this uh, on the other side of this break. And uh, if you want to call in with any questions, you're welcome to 323-746-TALK, 323-746-8255. Stay tuned. If you've been listening long to the Tim Donnelly Show, you know that we talk constantly about defending freedom and about defending our natural and alienable rights. The Firearms Policy Coalition is a partner of the Tim Donnelly Show. But more than that, they're on the front lines every day in Sacramento and all across the state in the courts defending your Second Amendment right, that that is a natural right that the government merely acknowledged in the Second Amendment. If you value your freedom, then you need to join Firearms Policy Coalition. Become a member. I'm a member, and I'm happy to support an organization that is doing such an incredible job. Go to joinfpc.org. The Tim Donnelly Show sent you. Or go to timdonnellyshow.com. And click on the FPC link to make it easy. But whatever you do, join today. FPC.org. Hey, we are, I guess we're on the home stretch. And we, by the way, if you're just tuning in, you are listening to the Radio Free California Network. I am your host, Tim Donnelly. And on the phone, we have, we're talking about the book, Gunsmith to the Stars. And we are talking to the authors, Corey Zamora, daughter of Manuel Zamora, and Dr. Tomas Martinez. Welcome back to the Tim Donnelly Show. Um, Thank you so much for having us. Oh, it's my pleasure. And, you know, so so Manuel, we, we we got your dad through the medical uh, school and then out of there uh, on to the army where he faced a firing squad three times and um, right. and survived and decided he wants to go to America, face down uh, some racist idiots in a town and just moved on with, with the aplomb he seems to have shown his whole life through. And, you know, he, he decides he wants to become a citizen, joins the U.S. Army, winds up in Texas on a base where he becomes the top mechanic and arms expert. And next thing you know, he's working for the silent movie Wings, which chronicled the World War II, or I'm sorry, World War I flyers in a huge battle. And uh, he winds up making friends with the likes of Howard Hughes, Cary Grant, and and a whole lot of of Hollywood producers and and, uh, celebrities resulting ultimately in, and this is where I ended so <laughs> you're going to have to help me this with the rest of the ended. story yeah that that's as far as I got so how does he wind up in Hollywood itself because I would think he's in the uh, in the army for at least a certain period of time uh, because Hughes aircraft was out near Santa Monica and he, he was working all the studios. And that's where we ended up in Culver City so, because that's where MGM was, and he could walk to work. But he ended up in California because of... Oh. I think... Uh, I think we had a... Gration, it's sort of like uh, Operation Paperclip. He wanted our people to have his know-how. Well, you're going to have to repeat what you just said. We lost you for about uh, 20 seconds. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, he was in, ended up in California because that's where Hughes had his armament division with Hughes Aircraft. Okay, so that's where he went after the after the army. Yes. And you, so where do you come along, Corey? Where, I was born in 1950 in Hollywood. <laughs> so you grew up on the back. Uh, my father was. Yes. Uh huh. We we. I was born in Hollywood, and then we moved to Culver City because he was working mainly for MGM, and so he could walk to work. And so, yes, I did grow up on a lot of back lots, and I got to see a lot of things that my father made, like Robbie the Robot. Um, you got to see all the big st- sound stages with the water tanks for he wore waders with these big model ships, the battle scenes from Ben-Hur. My father worked on every version of Ben-Hur and the Ten Commandments from the silent to the, to the to, uh, just before he passed away. Wow. Now that that is amazing. So he got to work with Charlton Heston and yes, yes. He started with the silent movies, and he was working on uh, Hell's Angels when they transferred it over to Talkie. So, um, so he met um, all the ladies too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, do you want me to ruin the end of the book for you? Well, I, look, we we we. Uh, it depends on whether you want people to buy the book. <laughs> well, I know. And by the way, it's if point of interest, let me let me just tell you the name of the, the what the chapter is called. Well, let me let me do it. Let me do a quick commercial for you first, because okay. I, what I did is I put up a post at timdonnellyshow dot com, which includes a link to Amazon where you can buy this book. Oh my god! And what You're we're talking cry again. What we're talking about is. It, it is called Manuel Zamora, Gunsmith to the Stars, written by Corey Zamora, his daughter, and Dr. Tomas Martinez. And it is, it, it's one of those reads that keeps you glued. And then the pictures are incredible. You're, you're taken on this journey through uh, major epic moments in American and Mexican history. Um, but it's such a simple story, too, on a, on a totally different level, about a man that completely commits whatever he commits to and makes friends almost immediately everywhere he goes. And God had his favor over him and, and kept him alive when others would have, would have been killed. You know, one of the contributions he made to uh, this country was that in the beginning of oh, about the, the start of World War II, uh, one of the big problems we had uh, with the uh, uh, fighter planes is, uh, and it wasn't just our problem, it was the, you know, the Axis powers had the same problem, where the machine guns would get jammed, you know, so they'd be in a dogfight, machine gun would get jammed, and that, you know, so the person couldn't fight back. Well, this was a standing problem. Howard Hughes, who was working for the government with Hughes Aircraft, uh, called Emanuel Lynn and got him involved in his... Uh, Hughes Aircraft Company and Hughes Tools, and he said, "Man, we got a problem here. You know, we have to find a solution to, you know, getting our boys a, a better chance of these machine guns, so they don't get jammed all the time." So, Man, you set about designing a new uh, system with what they called chutes that had steel, stainless steel bearings, so that they would not get stuck, and you don't need someone trying to feed the machine gun. He put them together to the point where it would shoot a thousand rounds a minute. Wow. On the, plat- on the platform of the aircraft. And they were able to shoot down the Nazi planes. And some of the Nazi pilots say that's why they lost World War II, because they lost air superiority due to that you know, shoot that Manuel in- uh, invented and Howard Hughes produced. And uh, consequently, they lost air superiority. We got it with his shoot, and uh, that signaled the uh, turning point in the war. And one thing thing that that I noticed in the book, and this is such a stark contrast between then and the society we have today, but the principles are timeless. Um, Manuel Zamora was known to be prompt, to be prepared, and to be an expert or at least willing to do whatever it took when he took on a project. And that was whether he was in the military, whether he was working in Hollywood, or perhaps even when he was working for, uh, you know, the mobster unknowingly. 
Um, but he, he had this commitment. He didn't make excuses. He didn't run around saying, hey, um, I'm not getting opportunities because everybody's being racist against me. Yeah, there were racist. There have always been racist, and there probably always will be racist. But what I really admire about him is he didn't let that derail him. He, he, he kept steaming on, and, and that determination led to, to him being the gunsmith to the stars, to being the guy who helped Howard Hughes save all those American pilots' lives because he was just damn good at what he did. And a lot of the stars, producers, and directors respected that element. You could always depend, right, Corey, on the yeah, father showing up on, on time. Him. Always could depend on him. Yeah. How long it took? Didn't he stay up late sometimes to run oh, the clock yes. just to finish? Yes, yes. You know, and, and when he started working, um, Howard Hughes introduced him as his armament person to Stembridge Guns. And so my father then had privy to Stembridge inside of Paramount, and Stembridge supplied all the movie industry with all the guns, period guns, for different types of movies. Yeah. Loser. Yeah, I think we might be having some trouble with Corey's... Well, well Stembridge, yeah, they had a, a big warehouse inside Paramount, and they had room there for uh, Manuel Zamora, he was a guy who worked on the specialties, making sure the guns work properly. And sometimes he would advise stars like George Raft, who uh, did, didn't really know about guns, but he, he liked to look like he did. And, and the man who explained him how to handle a gun, not draw, but to hold it with authority, how well, to he, point it. And, he, uh, he became... He, be he, he, could, he could make parts for antique guns. He used a metal lathe, and he could create parts that were obsolete for antique guns. That's amazing. And, and and on one of the sets, it, it, they said that all of the stars came up to him because there were a lot of guns used, obviously, in a war movie. Um, and, and, and he became the number one expert just through his own abilities and, uh, and, and began to develop these relationships. And ultimately, it led to when, when he went to get his citizenship, he had none other than Howard Hughes vouching for his character. Yes. Yes. They were letting uh, people immigrate uh, during the Depression. You couldn't just cross the border. <laughs> it was not like today. <laughs> Nowhere near today. You had to be a person of value to the country in order to allow you to stay here and apply for citizenship. And you didn't so want he, another country to get it. Right. So the guy's too valuable. We can't lose him to another country. He's an asset to the country, and so he vouched for him and signed for him, sponsored him, and you know made sure he had employment to satisfy all of the uh, uh, requirements of good citizenship. And he was proud to be an American. He he told, if you change countries, you got to support the country you know that you live in, and and uh, that's uh, maybe that's one reason why he lost touch with Mexico. But he was a he was a true American values guy. Very well, true. Now, Very true. Now, Corey, you, you mentioned that, uh, do you want to spoil the book and tell the last chapter? Um, <laughs> well, I'll don't, tell you what Don't spoil it, but, but tease us a little bit. Give us, give us a little, we've, we've only got about well, a minute left. A, Go ahead. One of the, the top of the list of anyone's worst movie ever made was called The Conqueror. And the last chapter of the book is called Dirty Harry Was the Conqueror. Okay. Well, that's, Dirty Harry they was, shot the, a movie, was the conqueror because they shot that movie in Utah. Well, then I I'm gonna yeah, Dirty, I, Dirty I, Harry was the. I'll tell you the where bomb. that came from. Yeah, with the atomic bomb, a ah. dirty atomic bomb, where the exposure to uh, radiation uh, is responsible for killing a lot of the stars: John Wayne, Susan Hayward, Pedro Almodarras, a lot of technicians and family members. Well over a hundred people died from. Oh my word! I yeah. I had no idea. I had no oh, idea. Fantastic. Well, and then they hauled seventy tons of the dirt back to the studio so the inside shots would match the outside. And to this day, we don't know where the dirt went. Wow, that's scary. <laughs> that is. Well, <laughs> you 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 know what? Thank you for coming on the Tim Donnelly Show and you sharing. Know, thank you, thank you, because I. 
I have I I got so much today just listening to you talk about what you had read and the joy and the excitement, and that was just a great gift to me. Thank you so much. Well, it's it's I my pleasure. That, yeah. Thank you, thank you for coming on today to share the life of Manuel Zamora, Gunsmith to the Stars. You can get the book at Amazon. Go to timdonnellyshow dot com. You're going to want to read it. Trust me, if you love movies or love guns. Um, 323-746-TALK if you have a comment I might let you on right after this break I'm Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I got the big muscles. They call me the governor. Well, here we are, the home stretch on a Friday. Final segment, and... You know, that that book is a fascinating read. Now, I admit it. I'm only halfway through it. I'm looking forward to reading the ending now. Um, you know, you just have no idea the effect that your life has on so many other people. And one of the things that really struck me about Manuel Zamora was that he's from another era. He's from a time when to immigrate to America meant that you had to prove, first of all, that you could bring something of value here. And he had this tremendous desire to become a citizen and was willing to do whatever it took. But he just, he had this work ethic that was almost Puritan-like. But but he also had this great gregarious personality and... You could really glean a recipe for success from reading his story, which was take that which is given to you and use it. Make no excuses. When you don't get shot in the head by Pancho Villa, make your life mean something. And he did. Uh, he, he, he did some amazing things. Not, not just working in Hollywood, but but developing a fix for machine guns that were malfunctioning that would have wound up possibly turning the tide of the war, who knows, or certainly costing us a lot more American lives trying to take down the Nazis. Um, So he was at the forefront of all these different battles between good and evil. And if it were not for who he was and the character that he had, and I think it says a lot about the character... Of Americans today, if you compare that era and the and the values that we held, and you look at what's going on in our country today, we opened up the show with people making excuses, constantly obsessed with complaining about their plight in life, whether it's because of their race or their gender or or oh, you know life's not fair. I don't get enough money from the government. People are, you know, uh, stealing from the poor to give to the rich, which is a bizarre concept anyway. The government is stealing more and more from the middle class in the, in the form of taxes in order to subsidize those who won't work for a living and in order to subsidize these super wealthy individuals who control the politicians and get cushy deals for, for themselves, like this trade deal, which hurts the little guy. But let, let's be clear. The only antidote to all of it is to determine your own destiny and live true to the principles that you believe in, that your your parents and grandparents taught you, which I think are very well reflected in, in this book on Manuel Zamora, Gunsmith to the Stars. Fascinating life. His life made a huge impact. And I don't know, I only hope someday that 
somebody would want to write a book and say that I made such an impact on this earth for the time that I'm here to be worthy of that. You know, what what, what an exciting thing. I, I really thoroughly, fully enjoyed reading that. And uh, I, I don't know, I think I was a little more excited about the book than even our guests, but you know, sometimes that happens. I was very enthusiastic. Hey, um, well, as we go into this weekend, uh, let's certainly pray for rain. It looks like it may be getting ready to unleash here in Southern California. Um, hey, I don't do this show alone. I want to thank my wife. I want to thank my producer, Bethany Nosco, the Nascanator. Cassie Cassidy, our intrepid guest booker. Sean McNeil, the extraordinary engineer, engineer extraordinaire. And you, the listener. Without you, we don't have a show. God bless you and Godspeed. 3 p.m. Monday, Tim Donnelly Show, out.